In the third and final panel of the symposium, um, perhaps in a way it's most closely related to my own research, um, looks at innovative projects and histories within the rural context that are rooted in local material practices and that are also highly experimental. So while this symposium focuses on highlighting the work of our esteemed guest speakers, I would like to add a little bit of background about my own work to further contextualize the conversation and reconnect it with the discourse at Cornell. At AAP, I direct the Rural Urban Building Innovation Lab, where we develop novel fabrication methods for the design of adaptable buildings at the rural urban context. Coupling digital construction technologies with natural and non-standardized material and computational protocols, uh, robotic fabrication, 3D printing, and technologies like augmented reality and mixed reality tools, the lab explores how local building practices can accommodate changing environments and lifestyles across the urban fringe and the rural context. The work, um, my teaching and research focus on developing easy to use intuitive digital processes and custom workflows such as mixed reality aided design and fabrication procedures for different types of biomaterials and non-standardized materials. And so the explorations study how low-tech material tactics can be augmented by emergent technologies to reimagine the future of rural construction. Some of these work is then transformed, scaled up, and recontextualized through collaborative architectural practice, um, through my collaborative architectural practice, HANA, that has deep roots and connections to the research at AAP and serve as a vessel for rigorous technical exploration and playful design speculation at full scale. So in our work, the performance and architectural expression are derived from materiality, digital construction protocols, robotic routines, and bottom-up design logics. And at the same time, in a mix of means, the projects are inspired by precedents, program, ecological concerns, collective labor, personal obsessions, and the misuse of technology. So within the lens of the experimental rural urban, such consideration of material resourcefulness, ease of construction, and local building practices that embody regional construction and ecological logic uh, knowledge are important factors when designing for communities in this context. Coupling these design consideration with emergent tools can develop nimble and sustainable material and methods that are adaptable to a range of scales and sites. And so the speaker's work tonight demonstrate that the rural areas are not stagnant and a potent space for building innovation. Tracing the development of the speaker's project from conceptual development to the experimentation with novel material methods we hope to understand how new hybridized system and architectural expressions can be created and developed at a local scale. The work situates the rule as a fluid context between the natural and the man-made, between technology and tradition. And the rural urban is also where architecture can be regularly mass customized to feed the needs of the diverse end users where local craftsperson can work hand in hand with robots, where origin, where original material methods can emerge from the cross influence between the rural and the urban construction techniques. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce the moderator of the second session, David Costanza. David is the principal of David Costanza Studio, direct, the director of Building Construction Lab, and assistant professor at, of architecture at Cornell University. Through practice, research, and teaching, his work questions how architects can operate as an engaged participant in the act of making. His work questions the linearity of design processes, defining new terrains for architectural interventions across scales, while establishing a dialogue between representation, computational design tools, digital manufacturing, building materials, the labor, and the environment. So welcome, David. Uh, thanks, Lizzie, for the introduction. Um, for those just joining us, 
Uh, the structure of the afternoon will be uh, three lectures followed by a panel conversation at the end. Each lecture will be around 25 minutes. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by three fantastic uh, speakers, John Lynn of the Rural Urban Framework, uh, Kurt Gambetta, currently teaching here at Cornell University, and Boonsern Primthada from Bangkok uh, Project Studio. So our first speaker will be John Lin. John is a professor of architecture at the University of Hong Kong. In 2005, John, together with Joshua, who we just had, uh, who just spoke in the second panel, established the Rural Urban Framework. The practice is conducted as a nonprofit organization, providing design services to charities and NGOs. We've seen some of that work already. RUF has built and is currently engaged in various projects in diverse villages across China and Mongolia. John recently published a book titled As Found Houses in 2021, which documents the unexpectedly innovative ways that rural self-builders adapt, modify, graft, cleave, and wrap their traditional dwellings. These case studies form the research context for his current design and teaching. John's lecture is titled The Future of Tradition. His work experiments with new ways to combine industrial and handcraft building technologies, rural and urban frameworks, and traditional and contemporary ways of living. So please join me in welcoming John Lin as the first speaker in our experimental rural session this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. I'm such a Harry Potter fan, so it's been such a privilege to come here and walk around campus. Um, I feel like I'm on the set. Uh, and to, to um, be part of such a great um, group of uh, sort of outsiders. And I guess for me, the fringe is not so much a place. It's a, it's a way of working. And so in a sense, the, the goalposts keep moving. You know, I mean, in 2005 or six, it was very unpopular to work in the rural. And now we find ourselves in a position where it's like really hip. So we have to keep finding more, yeah, yeah, more of sort of unpopular things um, to do, you know. So, um, I, and one of the thing that's things with uh, Josh you'll see is that uh, we almost always disagree. And that's been one of the sort of great aspects of working together um, on rural urban framework. We have very different um, approaches. You know, um, I just realized, Josh, that if you're sort of becoming urban, I guess my talk would be becoming rural, um, coming back to the rural. And I just want to talk very personally about where I am um, in my own investigations. And in a sense, reinvesting in the rural and investing in um, working with communities to build for themselves. Um, this for me is um, the only and the most sustainable way um, to consider the, the future of architecture. Uh, my talk also begins with uh, a kind of midlife crisis. Uh, it's, it's a good way to, to sort of change your trajectory. And at the time, I think Josh and I, we were getting more and more commissions. Our building projects were getting bigger and bigger. Uh, it was becoming super stressful. At some point, I, I was afraid that he might murder me. So um, I, I took a pause and I went back to an interest I had when I was uh, also studying um, at the uh, Cooper Union. This is an image from the exhibition um, Architecture Without Architects. It's something that I've always um, been fascinated by, and it was always in the background of our work, these traditional buildings, but we always try to avoid them. Um, we thought, you know, the village is the front lines of the urbanization process. And as we looked deeper, I began to revisit this book um, in the introduction by Rudolfsky. I mean, he, he calls it a lot of different things, um, you know, the anonymous, spontaneous, indigenous. Each of these things mean something different. Um, I started to re-look at this book, not as um, typologies or buildings, but as a process of, of design. You know, if you, you think about this kind of 
traditional buildings, but really just think about the informal ways of design and how can we begin to adapt you know, this sort of informality into our design process. This, be, this became a kind of interest of mine. So uh, having had a kind of breakdown from trying to be an architect, uh, I went to visit one of the images in the book, which was um, taken by a German um, photographer flying over the landscape. And this is in Northern China where they have these underground houses. It's, it's a great um, typology. I mean, it's farmlands above, uh, there's no real building material. So everything is just dug straight down and then rooms are excavated. Um, and I began to ask myself, you know, what is architecture without architects today? What we discovered when we visited this site was that, you know, they had built a factory. This was connected to the village. So also, you know, the story is not just a kind of change in the physical built environment, but really a change in the uh, economy, you know, and in how the village functions. Um, people start to build their own houses above ground. It's not just that uh, these houses are old. There's also a perception of, you know, what is modern life and rural villagers are, are pursuing um, a, a livelihood and an idea of, of building and of life that, that wants to be contemporary, to be urban. Um, if you look elsewhere, I mean, in the book, this is uh, Rudowski looking at the sort of um, perfect uh, synergy between, you know, the 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 gear or the you know Mon the nomadic tent and lifestyle. And you know, you saw Joshua's lectures um, about the gear, which kind of powers this this um, urbanization process, this unprecedented urbanization process, because they they can just simply move to the city. And elsewhere in southern China, um, you know, these fishing villages, which function as public spaces. So, you know, they live there. Um, they, uh, you know, you cross other boats to get to your house. It's a kind of community. And now if you go there, um, the way that the, the, the economy has transitioned is that they've turned to fish farming, which creates a completely new type of village. It's, a, it's a, both a physical ground um, and it's also a completely new way of uh, building houses. So they've created their own system of building. So this idea of the traditional is not static, but, you know, th it's evolving constantly. And, you know, there's a China mobile shop, there's kindergartens. So gradually this village actually just sort of migrates to the water. I don't have a picture of the Tulos, but in Rudowski, he talks a lot about these, you know, fortress cities. These are common uh, typologies in uh, this sort of uh, world of traditional architecture. In China, uh, the Tulo is very similar. Uh, it's a very uh, <clears throat> competitive culture. And, um, you know, they're, they're built for defense. But if you go there now... Um, What's happened is that the, you know, as people build their houses um, and build individual houses, suddenly it becomes incredibly dense. Where the the situation before is a very interesting typology of almost an urban typology in the rural. These are like collective housing units. Now the open spaces are some of the within the tulos are some of the um, only available ones. If you look inside, what's, uh, again, the kind of conflict is that, you know, people live in vertical stacks because they are responsible for defending their section of the wall. So if everyone wants a kitchen and toilet, they just take the collective space and divide it much like a pie and everyone builds their own toilet and kitchen. It started to occur to me that perhaps there is a role for the architect in this idea of, you know, architecture without architects. You know, could architects enter this now in a contemporary sense and find a new project um, to do. On the outside also, um, you know, they build their own individual houses. The Tulo becomes a kind of um, uh, a representation of the struggle between the collective and the individual. And this idea of individualism, I mean, that's a almost like a kind of contemporary um, 
you know, symptom. Okay. So how can we define, redefine the role of the architect um, within this? Um, in the book that was mentioned, um, I have a copy for, for um, uh, Leslie and Hanshi. Uh, it's made with uh, another colleague of mine at Hong Kong U, uh, Sony Deva Bhaktuni. Uh, we went to school together and we began to document these stories um, throughout four different sites in China. This was the very first house that we uh, documented, which was an old couple that had built a small house um, above ground, but continued to move into the underground house in the summer and the winter. And what was remarkable was that there was kind of a nice story of sustainability that was not through technology, but through a kind of lifestyle transition. And it was both modern and traditional. I mean, you have, you know, um, they talked about the, the Taobao villages. What's interesting for me is that you have uh, families which are still farming and then they're working on e-commerce. And these are absolutely seamless. So there's no real sort of, you know, you could both be rural and urban. It's uh, very blurred, but you can also live in the both modern and traditional ways. I'm just going to skim through this book. Um, this talk was a much longer one that I didn't have a chance to edit. So I'm going to just show you some images and, um, you know, like a, uh, somebody who converted and turned one of the rooms into a, a restaurant and then basically built a driveway to access this underground house. Um, <clears throat> this one's interesting because they, um, in order to build the, the road, they actually have to cut down into the soft earth. So you can see the house, you know, the, the two houses on the either side, they just simply excavate the earth. But in this house, what's interesting is they opened up a shop and you go through the, um, the, the store and they still have very much this courtyard uh, behind it. The book was also a great lesson, not only in terms of rethinking the role of the architect. Rudolfsky talks about the untutored imagination. I mean, a great lesson for, for me, you know, having tried to work professionally for 10 years. But it also redefined for me um, the role of architecture and exposed how much uh, as architects, we are um, constrained through by our formality. You know, we have a kind of almost a formal aesthetic. So the way we discovered these houses was very simple. Um, we basically drove around the landscape and we looked for the most fucked up things that we could find. I mean, I'm not no after, but we looked for the strangest and things that just didn't look like you know, like architects would hate them, you know, or, or you would show it in a review and probably you would get trashed. And every time then we would go and we would talk to people, we would investigate, well, they don't have very much money. So everything made sense. They didn't do anything um, which, which uh, was uh, superfluous or only aesthetic. It was very interesting that when they were sort of, here were these untrained architects and when you do things that just make sense, actually, you get something very different, I think, aesthetically. So there was a kind of uh, almost uh, a release. And we, uh, we drew these things, we documented to try to represent them as potential typologies, uh, strategies, contemporary strategies for houses. Um, this is, uh, I'll just talk about this one. Another house which is near the highway. But in this case, um, it, it's a very wet land, so the highway has to be built about four meters above the ground. And if you see over there on the left image, um, you see all the, the, the Chinese characters. Well, they basically take apart the house. One of the things about the wooden house, which is nice, is that there's, they're built without any nails. So they can be easily taken apart. They built this um, concrete frame and bridge and then just rebuild the house to connect it back to the highway. So there's a kind of almost a power, a kind of resilience to these traditional houses that they have an advantage that perhaps modern houses or concrete houses um, don't have. And we were very fascinated by this. We were fascinated by the idea that you could put 
dismantle a house in a day and put it on the back of a truck and move it. And this is something that comes back later when we start to work with projects. So all these houses are being recycled constantly. They're also being combined with concrete frame. The details are maybe, uh, you know, you know, could be developed, further developed. And so there was both an admiration for the, the rawness, the, the, the sort of um, spontaneous purity of these um, strategies, but also a sense that um, how would the architect actually improve on these or how could the architect contribute to something, you know, that was already highly innovative? Okay, so I'll, I'll just skip through some of these. A lot of these actually have inspired um, later design strategies. So after I got out of my midlife crisis, I did go back to making architecture, but trying to work on as small projects as possible, um, as inexpensive projects. And I'll just uh, flip through some of these. And this is a, a, a case in, um, in Shangri-La, which is uh, Tibetan. Um, this was the very first house that they, they live in these traditional um, rammed earth houses and they cut the house in half and built a kind of steel and glass um, enclosure. This was the first house that did it. We could trace it back to one house. And later on, if you walk around the city, the entire city, which used to be big earthen, you know, buildings, it's a glass city. It's, you know, it's completely lit up at night. So the, it's gone through an incredible transformation and a local economy, a local industry has sprouted to make these things. Okay, great. That's 10 more minutes. Okay. I have about like three more hours of slides. Okay. But this is where I'm at, um, where... I'm in the belief, uh, increasing belief that um, the power of architecture is its ability to tell stories and its, abil its ability to contain stories. Um, this guy is a local gangster, a good friend of mine. <laughs> he starts his morning here and uh, there's this glass floor. He's breakfast and then lunch. He conducts his business, plays mahjong. Uh, people come visit him. And then the entire family gathers in this room, uh, four generations at the end of every evening. It's like uh, 13 people. Um, so again, this idea that you, know, you could live in a very contemporary way and have also a very traditional lifestyle in both contemporary and traditional spaces. Okay. And these are the collective houses again, you know, a completely new typology. If you think about this as a kind of housing typology, you know, you've got part of the house which faces an inner courtyard. It's part of a kind of collective structure. And then there's a private section of the house and you just walk through this door right here. Okay. I want to show you a quick film. How do I? Okay. Maybe. I think I better speed this up. Okay, but maybe I'll tell this story about it. So again, this is a story. It, it has a lot to do with um, working experimentally. I think it um, also has to do with uh, financial um, you know, processes. I mean, probably what we've done as a urban framework is that we haven't really invented architectural typologies. We've invented uh, new financial models. Uh, for which to make experimental architecture. And uh, every one of our projects is funded differently. Um, so this series of work started with a studio. We use students as guinea pigs, like you do here. 
and we, we brought them, we, we documented uh, a lot of these villages. We got a grant. Through the grant, we did a more formal research. From the research, we began to talk with the government, and we began to discover that this village, which is Longyang, is sort of the second most famous sort of Chulo village. So they were very competitive in a sense of wanting to, um, you know, uh, also sort of become a kind of tourist destination. And in our conversations, we decided, we thought their Tulos weren't as big or weren't as round or as famous. Could we come up with a different kind of story? It was a very urban context. And people started already transforming the Tulos into public programs. So this one is not very beautiful, but we worked with it because um, they had already converted it into a school. And we simply added a library. So we, we thought about the, um, the sort of defensive window. We kind of transformed the typology to actually extrovert it, to open up. Um, when you go up the stair, you actually have to kind of crouch down and you really feel like you're crawling in through a window. There was a second typology, a uh, second too low. And um, this one at, at that point uh, was abandoned, but it was the tallest one and they wanted to attract investors. So we actually created a new way to experience the Tulo. Now it's turned into a, a kind of a, a museum. Um, there's a lot more investment in the village. But the, the reason it looks like this is also that, um, I mean, I, I, if, I, if I can, I try not to design anything. Um, that's a kind of generally a good rule, uh, which is to try not to design, but, um, because the, the Tulo, the building is about 300 years old, uh, we couldn't touch it at all. So structurally, um, the, the structure had to be its own scaffolding. So it, it's a spiral stair because basically we, we built it as it uh, spiraled upwards. Okay, um, this experiment is political, it's economic. I'm gonna skip through all this. I think Josh talked about it, um, the funding models. Okay, I want to show two more projects. Um, yeah, but, but this is at the back of that Tulo, actually. Um, it's a toilet. So we, we merely copied them, which is a very important, you know, sort of uh, rural when you work in the rural, to just simply copy. <laughs> And, and this is what happens to the model. So I think if you have a kind of successful working collaboration, um, your models end up like this. Um, the, the, the traditional builders, they actually contributed quite a lot to the design of this. We, we had some ideas. Um, okay, so if you experiment, I mean, this is about the experimental studio. Uh, I always show this project because I think it's important um, to show failures. Uh, this was probably the project that was the most successful in the kind of architectural media sense. And then when somebody, you know, drove their car into it, um, nobody could really fix it. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that we had complete control over every aspect of it because uh, we had a donor that essentially, you know, wanted to build the house. Uh, we had this idea we should build a house that um, would be an example of um, rural resilience. And we put all sorts of ideas into it. It's both, you know, it has a cross section, which is not, you know, not pitched and not flat. And they dry stuff on the flat roofs, but then it collects a lot of rainwater. Um, but it's very dry, but sometimes it rains. So we did a, a, a stepped roof um, and it basically collects water from the roof. The idea was to, to, give them back uh, the strength of the rural, which is not needing the city. And I think there's something about the way that rural development is happening that is actually increasing their reliance on the city. And I wonder, for me, I'm really questioning, you know, whether that's the right strategy or how do we uh, fund, change this kind of fundamental um, uh, diagram? Okay. So anyways, this is a big failure. It's uh, totally abandoned now. Um, there's a lot of reasons. It's, it's really the politics of it. Um, 
But again, I don't have time for this uh, story. Okay. Okay, I want to show um, also uh, another series of work with another colleague of mine, uh, Olivia Altever. We just recently published a book. The book is about 10 years of design build that we've been conducting out of Hong Kong U. And it's a reflection on, um, on the rural and the kind of struggle to control. So it's interesting, you know, when you start out as an architecture student, you're probably a very cool person. But if you work professionally as an architect, you become very uptight and, you know, you become kind of like a, a horrible person who has to control everything. And we were very interested in all the aspects in which, you know, you don't control because a lot of things are not in your control. But this, this will to control, um, I'm very inspired by this drawing um, by uh, Scarpa. Um, where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a detail of tiling in the Castle Vecchio project in the, uh, the little small chapel. And I think it really demonstrates a little bit that through a, a new use of drawing, not as a vehicle for complete control, but drawing as a means of defining the line between what you control and what you don't control. So the book has a lot of drawings. It has all our, um, our uh, construction drawings. But it also documents uncertainties. Um, okay, so this project basically leads to the next project. I'm going to skip it. I mean, this decision was taken on site because uh, they gave us a piece of land. We had a donation to build a library, but we I really didn't have enough money. We had something like four thousand U.S. dollars or something, and then we passed by this new plaza that was built by the government and this four meter high retaining wall. So it was kind of a weird mistake, like urbanistically, it actually divided this new plaza from the rest of the village. And we thought, wow, we have like half the building right here. So why don't we just build this, this roof? You know, very simple means, always very simple, but it's a door and in cross section um, turns into a six meter high room. So essentially, um, it's a very small building. It's a, probably one of my smallest projects. Um, I'm trying to get only do smaller projects from now on. It's a bridge, so you, it connects to the this plaza. Uh, kids play on it. Um, we installed a book sh bookshelf. They want it to turn it into a library. There's a piece of furniture. It's a bridge. It's a landscape. It's just one structure. We went on to do a couple more. And this project led uh, to the next project. Uh, <clears throat> I, there's a lot of bamboo um, in the exhibition. I know that you guys really love bamboo. Uh, to confess, I really hate, I, I don't like bamboo at all. So, so we use bamboo, but we get rid of it. We like, we burn it, we, we throw it out. Um, but it was, it was really nice as a, um, we used it as scaffolding actually. And this was a commercial project uh, for a hotel. Uh, the resolution is not very good. And one of the interesting things is, I think once we started to build this, we realized we couldn't build it um, in Europe or the US, you know. And so there's something about the rural having very little money, having very little expertise, having very little control. No one listens to you. You can only go to the site through extremely difficult processes. That actually allowed us to do things that were surprising and um, which we probably couldn't get away with if we tried to build this um, with all the available technology and, and money. I mean, structurally, well, I mean, this is... <laughs> um, but I guess, it's that modern processes of architecture are, it's not about safety, it's about insurance. So again, it's, you know, it's risk averse. And it's a lot also about this, so f this, this desire to control risk. Um, and that's also what the rural represents for me as a kind of um, 
ground for experimentation and what the school represents. This is from uh, Olivier Ottaver, my colleague, his studio. And so all these forces are converging. We did this design build, um, this kind of S shape, which became the scaffolding. Um, you know, so we took the same project but used it as scaffolding. Then at the same time, he was developing casting techniques with bamboo and um, fabric. And we simply combined them. So over the course of like uh, five or six years, this kind of very meandering path that we couldn't really anticipate you know, how we would use it or where we, it would lead. But this was key to be able to prototype this directly on site, uh, to have workers that um, are both kind of untrained, but they're naive, and so that means they're open-minded. And um, they're willing to work with, with crazy architects. And, and this guy was the key to the whole project because he was the only guy in the village with a donkey. And so he was basically got very rich delivering all the materials into the mountains. OK, and uh, am I almost out of time? I'm past. OK, I, I was not looking at you. <laughs> Sorry. And this is the, the, the last project. Um, but it's, it's in the exhibition, I guess, I saw. So I, I think the rural has always been about technology. You know, it's always been about how you build. And um, recently I've been interested in um, combining technologies in the idea that, uh, you know, the robot, robotic 3D printing, is perhaps a form of um, building sustainably, or you can take apart a hundred wooden houses and every time you print new walls, it can be different each time. Um, this was made in concrete, but the, the next version we're working with earth um, to make this. Okay, should I stop the film? This is it, I'm done. No, no. Did I go over 25 minutes? I did not, that's the problem. Sorry. I just got pictures of the finished project um, literally last night, but I, I wasn't able to upload them. And I, I really don't know what to think about this at all, actually. Um, it was just a hypothesis. Um, it's similar, you know, like uh, some years ago, the 3D printing, I mean, um, nobody really wanted to use it because they felt like, you know, you're not really uh, designing, you know, by, by you know, cutting cardboard and gluing it together, that that would be part of your process. But now on every single student's desk is a 3D printer. Um, so I don't know about the future of 3D printing. I'm not speculating on things. But I do know that instead of shipping a whole truck full of steel or concrete or brick, uh, we might as well ship a robot. Um, and this, this goes back to this idea that I presented, the uh, two beliefs that I have. One is um, I'm committed to helping communities and empower them to build locally and to build um, without uh, tying into this kind of um, economy of industry, of industrialization. And secondly, that this building has a story to tell. It's a hundred year old building. It's already transformed many times. This is just one more of its transformations. Unsum, I'm sorry, you have only 10 minutes left. But it's very fascinating. I mean, I really appreciate, you know, um, like Leslie's work. Um, in some sense, I'm, I'm super, um, I'm, I'm very inspired by it. I think, you know, for me, it's, it's also 
about a, a, a way of that the fringe is like a process, you know. And the final thing I have to say is I worked with um, Lydia Ratoy, who is a kind of um, robotic fabrication researcher at the University of Hong Kong. And I don't know if it happens here, but you know, the guys who work in the rural and the people who work with robots, we're like enemies. So we don't talk to each other, we don't socialize with each other. So there's also these weird boundaries in architecture. And I think it's quite interesting to also begin to break down even our own internal boundaries and these kind of um, cross uh, influences, I think may produce, I don't know, interesting experiments. Yeah. So. But you can imagine that the, the carpenters come afterwards because they adapt. And the robot, he can do anything, but it can't adapt at all. I mean, it's like just, that's it. You press a button. And so there is this funny uh, relationship between the two of them. Thanks, John. Uh, I look forward to expanding on these topics in our panel uh, at the end. I want to jump right into our uh, second speaker, Kurt Gambetta. Uh, Kurt is a visiting critic here at Cornell University. He is an architectural designer and historian with research interests in the history and politics of building materials, field work in architecture, the spatial politics of waste, and modern South Asia. He is a PhD candidate in the history and theory of architecture and urbanism at Princeton University where he's completing his dissertation about the history of material substitutions and post-colonial India. Kurt's lecture will expand on his ethnographic approach to building technologies, particularly the training of individuals in stabilized mud construction in South India. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Kurt Gambetta. Thank you, David, and thank you, um Thank you, Leslie, for the invitation to speak. It's uh, ha having now seen what everyone else ha um, has brought with them today in terms of ideas and projects. Um, I can see so many different points of connection, and, and it's a really nice to have an opportunity to, to share my work in the school. So I think to understand what is meant by real technology, I want to begin in the city. During 2019 and 2020, I participated in a series of workshops about the use of cement stabilized mud and other so-called alternative building technologies in the city of Bangalore, a major metropolis in South India. In a workshop held in July 2019, I joined other participants under the Badam Tree and Open Air Laboratory at Myanmar, Mai, pictured here, which is a consultancy in alternative building technologies. One by one, Workshop participants stepped up to try their hand at the Mardini Press, a soil block press designed by K.S. Jagdish, one of the engineers who lectured at the workshop. Participants were evidently surprised by the force required to compact stabilized mud blocks. The main ingredient was non-expansive red soil, that is, soil whose constituent elements will not absorb water and expand in volume. Without compaction, non-expansive soil is shapeless and vulnerable to the movement of water and air washing away or blowing off into dust. Organizers explained that cement, lime, and different methods of compaction, such as machine-driven pressing and manual ramming, give soil structure form and stability. Before handling the press, they invited us to get involved and lend our hands and feet to the work of making soil stand still. To make stabilized adobe blocks, a group of student interns from a local architecture office threw off their slippers and shoes and stomped the goopy mixture with their feet a procedure known as pugging. Though the topic of our workshop was a material, in effect, which is cement stabilized mud, most of the examples workshop organizers shared with us were houses. By their own account, organizers illustrated that cement stabilized mud was central to new approaches to low cost housing in post-colonial India. But as I learned from workshops, interviews, and discourse surrounding alternative building materials and technologies, 
Purveyors of stabilized mud in the 1970s did not uh, construct much in the way of housing, at least not until the mid to late 1980s. And the 1970s is this kind of moment that I'm talking about in the paper as a moment in which um, soil, what was formerly called soil cement, was effectively revived. So instead, they imagined their role, instead of constructing housing, as, as one of disseminating building techniques and technologies to the rural poor, expecting that rural populations would build houses for themselves. The proposition was not unprecedented. In lockstep with the priorities of American technical aid, the authors of the first five-year plan for India in 1952 imagined that if armed with adequate technical assistance and requisite equipment, rural populations in India could build houses for themselves, or what the plan and American aid programs called self-help housing, which is, I'm sure, a term familiar to many of you in the audience. Industry, and specifically the concrete industry, also sought to disseminate technical assistance for the use of cement-stabilized earth through building manuals and demonstrations to cut costs for house builders and in response to persistent shortages of cement and steel in India after World War II, which extended well up into the 1970s and 80s. But whereas planning and industry-sponsored technical education envisaged the provision of technical assistance as a way of extending the spoils of development to rural populations without having to make significant government investment, engineers and architects in the 1970s embraced mud building techniques to address the needs of rural populations that they claimed development planning had overlooked. In doing so, engineers, economists, architects, and others revisited Gandhian critiques of Western technology as destructive of the moral fabric of village life in India. For Gandhi, of course, it was the village, not the city, that was to be the locus of post-colonial modernity in India. From the perspective of critics of development in the 1970s, labor-intensive technology stood in stark contrast to the in industry-centered priorities of state-led development up to that time and the labor substituting technologies that they relied on. Government-sponsored industrialization left its mark on the technological fabric of building and infrastructure, as you can see pictured here in a series of advertisements published in 1953 by the largest cement conglomerate in India, which is the Associated Cement Companies. Mud is, of course, a very different kind of technology than cement. Unlike cement, its making is seen and felt in building sites, the fact of which is celebrated in contemporary training workshops like the ones that I attended. One can say the same for the soil block presses that are used in workshops. Their operations are visible and sensible to those who use and learn about them. So today, I want to trace ideas about manual labor and some of the materials I'm talking about in present-day Bangalore to scientific research and development about technology for rural populations in the 1970s. I focus on workshops organized by a group of engineers associated with ASTRA, an erstwhile research cell at the Indian Institute of Science whose operations spanned the waning years of Nehruvian socialism in the 1970s and 1980s to the period of economic neoliberalization after the 1990s. In some respects, ASTRA's emphasis on knowledge making resembles collective learning about earth and construction in the work of the Earthship Movement, uh, pictured here, CRA Terra, which some of you may know, and other in initiatives in the Global North during the 1970s and 80s, which were, of course, entangled in many ways in the Global South. So this should really come as no surprise, given the global circulation of concepts, practices, and technologies associated with what was variously called appropriate or intermediate technology during especially the 1970s. But while architects and engineers in India participated in appropriate technology discourse, Research and training in rural building technologies during the 1970s redirected anxieties in appropriate technology discourse about the perceived rapidity, that it was too rapid um, in terms of technological change in the global south. They kind of redirected these anxieties to concerns about post-colonial sovereignty and social inequality in rural India. So in what follows, I show how ASTRA's research and training initiatives about cement stabilized mud informed changing political and social projects of sovereignty in India after the mid-1970s. I first discuss how research about stabilized mud prompted urban civil engineers to introspect about their methods and professional commitments during the 1970s and 80s, refocusing their attention from Western science to low-cost technologies for rural India. 
I then show how training workshops run by the same group of civil engineers in post-liberalization India invite mostly urban house builders and other individuals to reflect on their values, conduct, and personal responsibility for the environmental impact of materials. In seeing how the settings, concepts, and practices about technologies for rural development change over the course of the past 50 years or so, I'm interested in understanding how neoliberal institutions and worldviews appropriated post-colonial debates about labor-intensive technology and local materials. So my hope is that in bringing a historical perspective to today's conversation, that perhaps we can unpack and ask questions about what we mean by concepts such as local materials and rural technologies and the kinds of labor that make use of them. ASTRA was founded in 1974 by an interdisciplinary group of scientists that included the chemist Emilia Reddy, pictured here on the, on the um, left, and the civil engineer K.S. Jagdish, here pictured on the right. ASTRA's acronym, Application of Science and Technology to Rural Areas, served as a clear statement of intent. Reddy, Jagdish, and their colleagues established ASTRA as a means to redirect industry-focused research and development in the Indian Institute of Science. This is one of India's um, premier science institutions, two rural problems that look beyond existing agricultural research at the institute, such as building and cooking. So, so the rural only appeared in the in the kind of uh, the kind of uh, frame of the Indian Institute of Science um, th uh, through the kind of context of agriculture up to that point. Um, and so, Astra, what it's doing is looking at other things like building, um, cooking, energy production, uh, transport, and so on. So Astra's focus on rural India reflected, uh, I would say, renewed political debates during the 1970s about the priorities of post-colonial development and India's changing orientation to capital and technology in the so-called West. Amulia Reddy, for instance, criticized the priorities of state-led development in post-independence India, arguing that the state had pursued industrialization in cities and townships at the cost of development in rural areas. He argued that over-reliance on Western technology had led to different forms of dependency, ranging from India's economic dependency in the form of balance of payments difficulties and the dependence of village economies on cities to forms of resource dependency, including the need for copious amounts of energy to power what they called Western technologies and over-dependence on what he referred to as public resources such as soil and water. Instead, Astra scientists envisaged that the widespread use of labor-intensive rural technologies for housing and other domestic equipment, such as mud stoves pictured here, that, this, that they would foster self-reliance among rural subjects by generating employment opportunities. Scientists projected that the use of stabilized mud transformed rural populations into workers. Labor-intensive technologies, by their account, would draw them out, would draw um, rural populations out of the doldrums of economic transactions that were illegible to development planning, or what Reddy and development economists of the time referred to as underemployment, a term that would later be replaced by the concept of the informal. In effect, that's what this category is called today. Labor-intensive technologies were designed to incorporate rural populations into a wage economy thus making them legible to efforts by the International Labor Organization, state planners, and other economists to measure labor insufficiency. Astra scientists drew on examples of soil cement housing from the immediate past, including examples of housing that followed World War II and Indian independence in 1947. Reddy had seen a soil cement house that an Indian naval engineer in Bangalore built for himself in 1965, using a Simba Ran soil block press that he had brought back from Colombia and South America during his travels with the Navy. This is the house pictured here. Jagdish also looked to recent histories of housing in India, for examples, rediscovering and documenting soil cement housing constructed by local public works departments and city governments, including workers' housing made with stabilized round earth blocks in Bangalore in 1951, pictured here, and partition refugee housing made with stabilized round earth in the Punjab in 1950. This is just after the moment of independence and uh, the mass um, refugee crisis that came after partition. So featured in important exhibitions such as the low cost housing exhibition in 1954, soil cement offered local and regional governments in post-independence India a direct inexpensive substitute for scarce and costly cement and steel. Significantly, Indian engineers in mid-20th century India who were working on these very projects cited techniques of pisse de terre construction published in colonial engineering literature. 
labor figured prominently in colonial construction, British colonizers used forced prison labor to construct smooth rammed earth walls that deterred prisoners from escaping. Though late colonial and post-colonial experiments with rammed earth did not, to my knowledge, use forced labor, I think one could understand here how genealogies of compacted soil and labor-intensive construction carried forward ideas about discipline and the transformative effects of manual labor, and in some ways translated them from a kind of colonial context uh, to a post-colonial context of different uh, somewhat different, uh, well, somewhat is an understatement, different concerns. So whereas soil cement housing referenced the concrete house, new experiments in stabilized soil referred to the language of rural construction in India. But what kinds of bodies would undertake the labor of their construction? Jagdish modified manual rammed earth techniques and soil cement mixtures used in the 1950s that he had been studying and renamed them stabilized mud. The name described a process of fabrication, stabilization, and acknowledged the additional inclusion of lime slurry and other locally prevalent ingredients. It was also a matter of cultural translation. As Jagdish put it to me in an interview, in contrast to soil cement, which, which he felt would not be meaningful to rural populations, he felt that, quote, the average Indian with a tenuous knowledge of English may readily identify with the word mud, end quote. Translation animated all aspects of stabilized mud production. Jagdish and his mechanic copied the naval engineer Simva Ram as found and without any interaction with Simva's engineers in South America and their extended network of technical expertise um, that, for instance, traveled through the United Nations. And using this, this, um, and used this, uh, this technology to produce what then Jagdish termed stabilized mud blocks or SM, SMB, which is a, a acronym I'll bring up again. So designed in 1957 to allow rural builders in Colombia to construct houses for themselves, Astra's use of the labor-intensive, manually-driven Simva Ram allows engineers to scale up stabilized mud production and fulfill Astra's objective of generating empl employment opportunities, specifically for wage employment. So though, as Farhan Karim, the historian has shown, the labor-intensive Simba Ram, though it was kind of mobilized in other parts of the global south and Asia, including South Korea, to create forms of community life that would counter Soviet communism, Astra's public-facing discourse shied away from ideological and political motives. After all, they were having to kind of assert themselves in a space of um, objective scientific research. But in practice, I would argue Astra implicitly imagined forms of community life in rural India that turned on the centrality of manual labor. As Astra moved its activities to the Bangalore's rural periphery, it became clear that engineers imagined themselves as external observers of rural life and technologies, not as laboring participants. And this was a, an image of the uh, Sinva Ran itself that was published um, out of Sinva's activities uh, in Colombia in the 1950s. Knowledge about stabilized mud drew heavily from the observation of existing rural building techniques and their material trajectories. In 1977, Astra established an extension center in Ungra, a village approximately 80 kilometers from the urban ISC campus, in order to understand the needs of the rural poor and test out low-cost building methods. Research about building materials took a number of forms, including surveys of village construction and, in 1979, a government-sponsored survey of embodied energy in rural buildings undertaken by Jagdish and a team of ISC scientists. Citing costs and the lack of ample electricity in rural areas as motivating factors, Jagdish's study scrutinized detailed comparisons between the extraction, production, transport, and manual labor required to use fired and industrial-made materials and, of course, their locally derived alternatives. This led him to conclude that cementless machine compacted soil blocks were the least energy intensive and hence most cost effective alternative to concrete and fired brick construction. In light of Jagdish's findings and the still unattainable cost of cement for rural builders of limited means, Astra constructed buildings in Ungra that were made of cementless pressed soil blocks, lime plaster, and other locally sourced materials, including houses for villagers, a dormitory, and staff res residence um, um, for the extension center. Um, this is what's pictured here. The extension center in Ungra allowed for what Reddy had called a requisite phase of self-education, those were his words, of institute scientists and rural problems. But it also embroiled village residents in Ungra in Astra's project of self-introspection. 
Considering Jagdish and Reddy's intellectual affinity to Gandhian politics, I speculate that Astra's preoccupation with employment and locally derived materials was shaped by principles of Gandhian political economy. Spatial proximity between produ production, consumption, and materials was, for instance, crucial to Gandhian theories of exchange. The Gandhian economist J.C. Kumarapa, whose writings informed Reddy's approach to technology, argued in the late colonial period, for instance, that growing distance between producers and consumers in an industrializing economy obfuscated their capacity to assess the moral consequences of exchange. Though Jagdish's study of embodied energy insisted on a conception of what he did specifically refer to as local materials that was derived from the engineer's calculations of distance, cost, and embodied energy, one could understand another, other conceptions of material locality at play here. The manual use of soil from within a given locality may have thus been imagined as a moral economy with the laboring body of the rural builder at its center. So the division of labor between manual work and technical scientific knowledge positioned upper caste engineers and lower caste villagers in familiar roles. As, adjunct, as the anthropologist Ajanta Subramaniam has recently written, colonial and post-colonial education institutions in India played a significant role in separating manual craft from technical knowledge along caste lines, relegating hands-on work to lower caste artisans and workers, while associating upper caste groups with technical knowledge in engineering and the sciences. Indeed, as articles and reports from the 1970s and 80s make clear, it was the engineer who served as the ultimate arbiter of material techniques. Informed by debates and, debates and development work, welfare economics, and appropriate technology discourse, astroscientists envisioned that the development of stabilized soil would allow engineers and builders in rural areas to choose alternatives to concrete. Choice was everything. But choice was not unmediated. According to Reddy, choice was to be informed by economics, not emotion. In his writings, Reddy envisioned a specially trained class of what he called rural technologists. In other words, engineers who would mediate the choice of technologies by studying and determining the technological needs of the rural poor. Choice thus ultimately referred not to the individual choice of rural builders, but to choice as it was determined in advance by either the Indian state or trained rural technologists. Jagdish had anticipated that compact and cement stabilized mud would find broad commercial use with the prospect of automated mechanized production in the late 1980s. But as he and other astro protagonists came quickly to realize, mechanized, um, economically disadvantaged builders who were the target of these experiments aspired to the social ideal of concrete housing and urban life, showing little interest in improvements to mud construction in villages. In this respect, the enduring legacy of building in the, in the village of Ungra may have been the engineer's self-education rather than the education of rural builders at large, as was the original objectives of their work. The content and structure of the workshops that I participated in originated during the late 1980s and early 1990s, as the cost-conscious urban middle class who built their own houses started to make use of stabilized mud blocks in Bangalore. Instead of the rural dwelling, the urban middle class house served as a living demonstration of soil-based technology for other urban home builders. Yogananda MR, the founder of Mirnmai, which we saw in the kind of first image of this presentation, and himself a PhD trained civil engineer who studied at Astra, built his house in exposed SMB technology in 1988, garnering significant local and national level attention, including nationally syndicated advertisements published by Hugco, the Housing and Urban Development Corporation in India, which played a, a significant role in housing finance at the time. In building manuals, advertisements, and built works, Hudco promoted stabilized mud construction as a means to address the enduring housing crisis among rural and increasingly urban poor. But the use of stabilized mud by middle class builders who were building their own homes signaled the appropriation of stabilized mud for a burgeoning private housing and land market in Bangalore, following the neoliberalization and globalization of the Indian market during the 1980s and 1990s, especially in 1991. Liberalizing financial institutions formed the initial impetus to training workshops, laying the groundwork for a kind of self-making that centered on the individual's acquisition of knowledge and skill. The first workshops conducted by Yogananda and Jagdish were held around 1989 for the newly formed National Housing Bank. As Jagdish recollected, the then chairman of the housing bank made clear to him that the bank had no role to play in constructing housing, seeing itself merely as a provider of loans and skills. Thus, from around 1989 to 1992, 
Astra trained bank-sponsored engineers in how to work with stabilized mud, ostensibly so that the housing bank engineers would train individuals in how to build, use it to build for themselves. The format of contemporary training workshops thus originated out of national structures of indebtedness as the state withdrew from its already anemic commitments to the production of housing, thus placing the burden of financial risk on individuals. The open workshops that I attended began in 1995 and continue to this day, ranging from one day training in stabilized mud to more comprehensive multi-day retreats. Workshop techniques and concepts reenact and subtly reinterpret the stakes of Astra's work in rural India during the 1970s and 80s. Technological choice, for instance, reappears in introductory lectures at each workshop, as do energy-minded valuations of so-called local materials. In my field work, I was struck by how workshop participants revisited the language of development debates in the 1970s, but steered concepts such as choice towards a sense of personal responsibility. For example, a young architecture professor who attended one of the workshops explained to me that as a teacher, she challenges students to understand materials and technologies as a choice, rather than a fait accompli, telling them, quote, you have to ask yourself what is required. Clients want you to follow the same construction. It's about thinking independently and thinking for yourself. Don't get, don't get into the trap of the rat race of what the construction world is doing, end quote. Participants that I spoke with conveyed a variety of sentiments and motivations for attending workshops, much of which centered on self-betterment and reflection. Several attendees cited a sense of moral responsibility about the environmental and social impacts of materials and suggested that learning about techniques of stabilized mud construction gave them a sense of freedom from educational and professional institutions that limited their ability to make choices for themselves. But freedom cuts both ways. Just as neoliberal institutions embraced training workshops to redistribute the risks and responsibilities of governance to individual home builders during the 1990s, Participants in present-day workshops are encouraged to evaluate the moral and economic consequences of choosing particular building techniques over others as individuals. The process of weighing and evaluating different consequences and risks may well be the ultimate horizon of hands-on learning in this context. One of the organizers informed me that participants do not end up making use of stabilized, that most participants do not end up making use of stabilized mud construction. Many individuals come, simply come away with a sense of self-discovery, indicating that skills and sensibilities, not buildings, are the workshop's primary outcome. Much as Astra engineers use mud construction to rethink their roles as engineers and scientists, contemporary workshop participants learn about stabilized mud to build consciousness about personal and professional modes of conduct, if not the capacity to build. Like Astra's research in the 1970s, Training workshops continue to raise questions about the energetic and spatial trajectories of materials, and here's where I'll conclude. In workshops, Yogananda explains to participants that much of the soil that they use to make stabilized mud is derived from waste earth from construction sites. Soil is available to construction by virtue of the accelerating pace of construction in Bangalore. Basements dug for new houses and apartments yield a bounty of excess raw material for SMB practitioners. Yogananda's mason, Mr. Nagesh, informed me that if it is not available in the city, soil is extracted from agricultural land on the urban periphery, land that is itself being subsumed into an urban real estate market. From the standpoint of both energy and extraction, building with stabilized mud is thus complicit, perhaps even opportunistic, about the changing dynamics of human soil relations in an urbanizing metropolis such as Bangalore, to borrow from the scholar Maria Puig de la Bella Casa. In departing and concluding uh, in the present, I wish, to, I wish to signal material trajectories and forms of labor that appear at the interstices of training and mud and its growing emphasis on individual responsibility. So if studies of extraction, transport, and, and the use of materials in the 1970s informed the engineers' re-education, new dilemmas about the circulation of soil may yet implicate a more complicated, dispersed context of knowledge making and self-reflection. Indeed, the growing entanglement of soil in urban and regional economies suggests that stabilized mud is implicated in an extended politics of caring for soil and its manifold interdependencies, which of course traverse uh, the urban periphery. Thank you. So our final speaker in the experimental rural session is Bunsurm Pramthada. Uh, Boon Serm uh, was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand. He established his office, Bangkok Project Studio, in 2003. 
Primtaro's work has won numerous international awards, too many to name, but his uh, recent pavilion, The House for the Human and The House for the Elephant, uh, represented Thailand at the 2021 Venice Architectural Biennale. Beyond the realms of theory and practice, Primtaro's work also carries a strong socioeconomic and cultural agenda, as many of his projects have social programs that aim to improve the lives of underprivileged. His work directly addresses building materials and invests new material systems uh, within the particular context in which he operates. Sorry, invents new material systems within the particular context in which he operates. The work is explicitly tectonic and materially expressive, exploring processes of making and their subsequent qualities and aesthetics. His work reinvents the use of old materials, such as glass block, constructs new materials, such as waste brick, and addresses a range of subjects from the human to the elephant. Please join me in welcoming Bunsurm Pramthada. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh the fourth and uh, the corner to have with me in here. And uh, today uh, I would like to talk about uh, something that is related about and uh, myself. And uh, I always ask myself about and uh, who am I? And, uh, but I cannot find the answer because it, and uh, when I was young, that I have the hearing problem. And right now, that I have the hearing problem also. That one side, I cannot hear anything. And another side, I can hear only the 30%. That's why it, and, uh, the sensation is very important to me. It, and uh, the sensation is related about that my work. It, it's my work, it will start from and the first work with like in a film school in and the 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 the, the one province in Thailand. It, it, the place that it, I would like to uh, talking about and uh, something that is related about the sensation. It like and the seeing, it like the cheering, it like the smelling, or the temperature and the spirit. It, to me, it like and uh, I feel like the wind, the light, and the sound. It is and my material. It is it it light and, and the material is related about and uh, the human. So it's and uh, this place. It, I would like to talking about and uh, something that is related about the sound because it's and I make it light and the part where it light and uh, the amplify for the sound. When you come inside, you will hear it the sound. But the some sound is not loud, but it's very quiet. I I talk it like it and look like it is silent. It's and uh, one thing that is then the, the client asked me, Bunsum is then I want to make the school, it's a film school, but I don't know that and uh, do you have an idea is then how to make the school to teach the student? I. I said that it's and uh, you know it's and right now it's and the student is then study to master. They are very very good in the theory. They are very good in philosophy. But it and uh, it to me I want to teach something about the attitude. The attitude is related about and the human. And I ask the student and how to be a human when you come to this school. This is and uh, one of the my idea is about the school and how how to be a human it by using and the architecture by using and the feeling and like it and if the student to come to inside they feel light and uh, they feel like the temperature they feel hot they feel cold this is and uh, it it may like they still alive. If they still alive, being they still a human. Um, for this place, and uh, I have learned that is and uh, this is the place for the silence. But the silence it tells everything to me. And another one is and uh, it's related about the human. But the human is and uh, it's this building, it this project. The human is and very very old. In this related. We have two and uh, small related, and the project is situation about 
it among in and the small village that it and I like to make it something like a very very small piece to inside. It's not about and only the architecture, but it's about about the life of the old lady. Some single, some widow. So it's and this is and the village that is we have to a lot of the lady who live inside. They are very good in and cook the food. So every morning they make the food and for the mountain. So it, that is and the, the food is very important to me and and important about and the project. And I I make it and the project is separated in the building and keep and the building it look like the people to come inside and look like the building is hiding in and the place in the hiding in the village. When we walk into inside, it, we have to a uh, small pathway it in and uh, a lot, in between and the building also. And we keep the name. The name is and every building it come from and the old lady. It normally is and the, in in Thailand we keep the name for and the important person. It's like that keep the name for the road. It keep the name for an a special building. But it's and this project I want to admire her about it and the one life that is for the old lady. They are very important in in the village. Walking and between. The place that the grandma is waiting the visitor to come inside. The inside is and the master space. It between about and the light and the, the natural material. We bring and the glass box to come by with and the wood. So it's and we want to talking about and the industrial. Industrial material it can combine with the net natural material. So it's and normally in Thailand it's be used with the glass box for the toilet. The unvaluable material is light and the glass box is become too and the valuable material in for the, this building. The grandma is then waiting to everyone to for serve the the food. And this grandma they cannot the 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 she didn't study in the school though and she cannot write and anything and she tried to write it for it it means like a thank you for the visitor to come to this village and after that it and uh, the pro another project it we make the project it and in and 2015 it relates about and uh, the elephant. We call like it's a project like a non-human centralist. Normally it's and uh, all of and uh, the the my experience that we sh we usually talking about and the human the human want the human requirement or anything. So in this project it and it related about and uh, the people and the elephant in. In, in the small village, it's not the center of the Thailand. And for 400 years ago, and the people and the elephant live together. In Thailand, we respect the elephant. It's like an equal and a human. Elephant is not our slave, it's our forced labor. And elephant is live in, in, in the deep village. And the part of the community is like in the part of the family. So this is and the most architecture is created for the human, but the elephant world is under attack with non-human centrally. And approach that to amplify the humanity by showing the empathy for the elephant. My architecture is less the question of how the human nature and the other living species it live together. The first building that is I design is the building is like the vertical. The vertical is related about and the side, but it's on this tower I want to and help revive the forest also. Normally we make it a tower, it's a vertical tower. The it light and the bring the people to up on the top. But to me I want the people to less the time to 
walk we slow down and every fall we have to the interesting and absorb about an atmosphere to every level or every floor. The design is related about the structure. I make it like an engineering structure. It becomes to the part of an architecture and the part of the atmosphere of the interior. So it's an, uh, in this side, it's very, very hot. So that's why we decided it like in the building, it like it and the ventilation, because it and we can bring it the wind, it come to in the building. And even if the floor, we decide it like it the gap or it the target also. The building is not, it look like the building, but it's a part of the skyline, it's a part of the landscape also. Because of and uh, we have to and uh, interesting about the velocity of the wind, the people to up on the top there. But when the wind blow, we use an atipong. It's like and the seed. You have to the leaf. It look like a helicopter and blow the seed. And then we 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 get it the forest. The new foliage that we call that we make is the building. It's an, the tower, it look like it's the first tree, but the first tree is like the give birth the new tree in and the forest. And another building is an, like the cultural courtyard. The cultural courtyard it want to make the something like it and the, the related about and the, the culture of the Kui people and the culture of the elephant that is related together. Um, it, this is an idea that it, we want to make the something like the, not only the architecture, and how to make the architecture, it become to the infrastructure. I think the soil, and then I think the soil to burn, it look like it's a place like for the human. And then, when we dig the soil, we get in the pond, the water comes in. So when we make the only one architecture, but we keep two things, we, 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 we got it the water in the pond. The elephant it can use the water in the pond, but the human it can use it like it and the, the theater in and the display. Elephant is very happy when they play the water in the pond. And the player is and they created the something like that. I said that this is an unexpected phenomenon. It's about the scale. The small stone, the small piece of the soil, it becomes to a scale. Or if the small of the wood, it becomes to a large scale. That is the scale it related about an elephant. This is and the scale of an elephant that it related about the architecture. And another building is an the museum. I make the museum because it and the one day I talk with and the some uncle. The some uncle is and the, this uncle is just lost and the son. The elephant, his elephant, it killed his son. And I asked him about this story because it, I know his son. And he said that it's an Bunsum. The elephant killed my son. And do you want me to call the police to cast my elephant to go to the prison? He said that she cannot do that because the elephant is the son. It's my son also. I have to take care of them. So this is and the story that it, I think about is and when we make it the museum. We don't want to make the museum it look like the multimedia or anything. We just want the museum that is the museum it like the life museum. The people it can listen their story by their own mouth. This is and uh, very important to me about when I make the museum. So the museum is and uh, we want to and make the space it like and for the vis visitor to come and feel like you have to the experience. The experience is like an unexpected moment. It sometimes like when you met you bump and the elephant in the pathway. 
or if the make it the roof shaped that it related about the skyline of the village. In fact, I decide that only 50% and the rest is decided by the nature. My architecture is performed the three functions and preserving the culture, reviving the forest, and build a safe, sustained community. The respect to each other is very important to every species in the world. Humanity is not just about the human relationship. We address our humanity through our relationship with other living creatures on the planet. The respect and contempt we show toward the animals affect the value of us as a human race. After that, is and uh, we we have and the project in and uh, in the west side we call and the uh, project is and uh, the west side Benale in and uh, in and in, in 2022 and uh, the project is and uh, it remind me when I work with an elephant world project I met the something it like is and uh, the elephant it have the food. They, and, uh, they are the animal that eat and the plant base. It like a napier grass, banana, or the sugar cane. So it's, and, uh, they eat a lot. Then. But I found uh, something that is and the product of and uh, they eating, the dung. It's very important to me because it, it's very unvalued material is to me. So it's an but it's an, in, in this project, in this village, we found the dung a lot because the elephant is and they poop the everywhere. So it's and the dung is and in the house, the dung in the pathway, the dung in and the, under the tree. Every place is and a lot of dung. I have to rethink again and think about and something that overlook object or our surrounding and find the potential possibility to increase the value. And then I try to think about how to bring the dung become to the big. I start to think, to decide about on the big mold. And by using like the big mold, it made from the handmade. It's very easy to, and the people to can make it and the big, by themselves. Um, this is the uh, final product of an uh, elephant dung pit. I decide it and uh, the big is we have to under uh, the hole in the center, but we have to under uh, the surrounding and the hole also. It's for easy to make it and uh, maybe we can use it and dry process or maybe we can use it a wet process. So if the hole it it it's easy to use the aircraft for the ventilation. As you know that it, in Thailand it's very, very hot. Then. So we use the air cap for a ventilation and make it the big, it lighter. And we have to send it this big to and the wide side in front. So it's done. we have to think about and the weight, we have to think about the stretch, the complex, the strong of the brick. And we make it the pavilion, it lighten a landscape that we call this project is an elephant theater. It related about and uh, the King Louis XIV that it make it like uh, the, the, the project is the dung is uh, situated in and uh, in front of the palace. The dung is sit and the dung pavilion is then closed at inside and the the Versailles Palace. We want to compare about and something it become to and from the local, from the global south that come to and then in and the, the most famous iconic place in the world. And we make it and the, the pavilion in Thailand and then we take off it and ship to the west side and we set up and uh, the tank, and you see it like it's and uh, the piece of and the glass that is and uh, occur in and the the brick. I choose it uh, this side. It's very easy and very 
very simple with four, and uh, everyone can do that. When it's under down, it's go to the west side. We have to the condition because if the cool letter said that we have to only one, uh, only two, uh, only two is a worker to install and this project, but we have to only seven day and one forklift. So it's an, I have to think about uh, how to install it. We have to the limited time to this project. And the tank is and uh, become to a uh, bio brick or the bio material in uh, the west side. The sustainability is and an started from, from the wood it and uh, it's a bio brick. The inside we plant and the, the, the glass and the glass that the elephant it can eat it. Okay, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and then we make it like and the small pavilion that it and it represent it the dung it maybe it can use it. And this is and the place it's for and the human it can use it. But it's a place it and uh, for remind to the human to awareness about the something it not not only not only it make it light and the building, but maybe it related about the landscape also. And we make the spiritual light and a produce and a multi color linen and cover the tree. And um, it is and uh, the feeling when the wind blow. It is and the is an It is an opening day of and uh, the president. In in an uh, west side region is come to and uh, to see that the town is and uh, not only and the building but make it everyone to good health. So it's the town that go to the everywhere in the world. It like an elephant theater in the west side. It like the stepping in the global south. I think the local material, know-how, and the culture from the Thailand to share for the people in France, and especially the future generation to learn it. And at that time, it and uh, in and UK, it's and they interesting about and the elephant dung also, but it's different because in, in UK they want to and the know-how. So it's it. I I I said that it's no problem. We can share the know-how to the uh, London in the Royal Academy of Art. We tell them everything for the recipe and teach them and how to make it. But this town is made by it and uh, it's a London people for the young generation. It's architectural school in 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 UK. But it's and uh, we bring it down from the Colchester Zoo, so that we want to 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 show that it's and the down can come from the everywhere in the world if we think about that. And this is and uh, the young generation, it's a young architect, this and uh, to participate in and the uh, project. I sent them all to them. And then if the one more is and uh, it was keep by is and uh, Sister de la Architecture, it's the archive of the Museum of the Architecture also. Or did I give and uh, the sum of the big thing to the Cornell though. And I, yeah. And this is and the dung is made from it light and, and uh, the lamb. So the in Versailles we make mix light and uh, the particular cement, like the Portland cement, but it is dung it and uh, mix with and the lamb. And the dung is situated in the Royal Academy. Um, we make like the final task with the dung is and meet with the goal and like the installation. And uh, some critic come and talk with me about the idea of the dung. And we make like the final task before the exhibition is open. The goal and the dung is combined together. In Europe, it is a developing region, a cadre of the scientific, advanced thinker, philosopher, and artist. My work is reflected a person who comes from an area with a less natural resort where the people are kind, humble, and rely on their instinct to survive it in the mindset of the limitation. 
I hope to give a new perspective that the people in Europe will be able to learn from it. And then if we make it under the real project, then for it a permanent project, it, the down it will come to and the local more with the big more it in in Ayutthaya. So it's under. Um, so then uh, I work it to and uh, many years is right now I can answer the my first question. Yes, I am a human. Thank you so much. Yeah, if I could ask the speakers to join me up front, we'll have a short conversation. I know we're at 6.30, but we'll take just 15 minutes and have a brief conversation. I'll actually, I'll start with maybe two or three questions. I'll try and keep them brief and then we'll open it up uh, if there are any other questions. Uh, if you haven't already, there's a wonderful exhibition just down the corridor where you can see the bricks, the dung bricks, and touch them and see many of the construction photos from the projects that were presented both in the second and third panel. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, maybe a question about how you engage with local builders and craftspeople. So specifically, I'm interested in how knowledge gained from others, so craftspeople, builders, the sort of non-architects, uh, can change the way you approach a design process. So I think, John, maybe you, you could start um, the way uh, your lecture started to engage the architecture with ar without architects, how that's changed your approach to maybe design processes that privilege other aspects maybe a building. I guess you just answered the question for me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think as architects, it's, it's kind of an interesting profession. You know, at the end of the day, we don't really know anything <laughs> at all. I mean, I think it is, uh, it's interesting for me. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a, Profession that I think deals a lot with uh, with empathy, you know, with the ability uh, and confidence to go somewhere completely different and to be able to absorb uh, and participate in this knowledge. So um, my favorite cookbook is um, Jamie Oliver. He he has this cookbook called America, and he travels all over the place to to like you know these different communities, and he he eats with them. And they have this meal, and then afterwards he he, he changes it, and then he cooks for them. And I I, I tend to think about architecture a little bit like that. And so you could say that's the the attitude, and and also the food. Like literally, <laughs> the food is very important with um, communicating with workers. So. I don't know if the question really applies to. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, yes, and uh, the non architecture or non architecture and uh, teach me about it. And uh, in the world, in the world, we have to many, many occupations. Right? The architect society is very small in the world. We have to learn. Architects should learn from the non-architect or non-architecture. It lies and, uh, you know, then we have to live like it and uh, the, the other field is like the law. Scientist or judge, because it, then we cannot live alone. So it is then, it is, it teach me non-architecture. It teach me about architecture, not only if not about it, then the only one important in the world, but it's a part of the world. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe expand on the question a little bit and jump into the next question. I'm curious more, even more specifically, how you engage those builders and at what stage in the design process, mm -hmm. and how it changes your how you approach a design process. Mm -hmm. And so maybe with that in context, we can also layer in the second question, which is more about the 
specificity of uh, opportunities that exist in the rural that maybe don't exist in other contexts. So again, John, you said something specific about you know the the lack of regulations or the kind of freedoms uh, uh, the the kind of workers that you're engaging with are quite different in that context maybe than others. I, I mean, I, I just think that it's an environment which is probably completely the opposite of architecture school. You know, um, if you go to a review, I mean, any school of architecture, mm -hmm. basically what you are discussing and evaluating is control. You know, like how, how well you controlled the project, how well you anticipated, you know, every aspect of it. And I think it's been a process for me of unlearning some of that. I mean, it's important, okay? So I'm not saying it's a waste of time, don't worry. Um, but I, uh, <clears throat> You're asking about, you know, I, I get it. I'm reading into your question. You're asking about, you know, what are the strategies or methodologies? And I think that that's a certain kind of um, uh, a language, you know, that, that we tend to think in terms of, you know. And I don't know if it, it, it really is that effective, you know. And I think that there is uh, this training and then there is uh, maybe like experience and the, um, I don't think that, you know, only the, the locals have knowledge. I mean, we have knowledge too. You know, for me, history is like very, very important. You know, and, and so we have knowledge of ways of doing things from other parts of the world, you know, that, that are not very local. And for me, maybe that's uh, the, 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 the most that we can offer. So, um, you know, I, I take a similar view with Boonserm. I mean, we're a little bit like, you know, I, I, I only make friends with people who are like, kind of like architects that kind of don't want to be architects, something like this, you know, very humble. Like, you know, <laughs> the, the more you do, the more you realize how, how little you actually know. But I, I think it's a very human, human process. And um, so, I mean, on the positive note, you know, you, you kind of get out of school and you continue to learn about, you know, what architecture means to, to I don't even like buildings that much, but, but building as a process is something which is completely different. And um, I think it's valuable in architecture school. And, and you know, I lost a little bit track of your question, but um, I'm just telling you whatever I think. Yeah, that's all right. I'm, cu I'm curious, I mean, maybe another or two continue building on it representationally, you know, you brought up the Scarpa drawing, right? And how the way you draw and represent a project change when you have less control over certain processes. Maybe that can guide the question a bit more too. Like maybe it's that second publication that you referenced, like how the way you draw and represent a building changes when you're not in control of certain parts of that. It, building process. It's about it, it, and uh, the, my work is and I, I make it like the, like the, if you see the brick, I, I, it's my design repetition. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Like it's like and, uh, the first vocabulary we cannot remember, like it's John, right? Like it. But if, if you like it and speak and every day, every day, every day, so it and the people it can remember. It's like you make the brick. It. The first bit is not good because it and they are on few level. But as I believe that it and uh, four hundred thousand bit is very good to me because it repeat it every 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 day. You know, this is and uh, very easy to teach them it's to me. I, I mean, I think it's really interesting how design changes. Mm -hmm. You know, through the process of of building. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't go with an intention, but I can yeah. read into your projects that the yeah. design is coming, you know, like step by step. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I visited um, Khan's building in Bangladesh. Were yeah. we in the same? I think you were there in, in <laughs> Dhaka. And um, it was amazing because there's a lot of decisions which um, he only made on, on, on site. And I think he, he, he passed away shortly after that. It was very aggravating, apparently. But you know, he didn't even design the, the roof of it. He kept delaying it and delaying it. And, and that was like quite interesting. There's a whole shelf of all these um, models for the roof, which are very consistent with the project. And what he does at the last moment is 
very surprising. And I think he can only decide that because there was incredible pressure. They were going to fire him. And the, the, the walls of the parliament were already coming up. And it looks like a different architect designed it. So I'm, I'm yeah. really yeah. amazed. Like, how do you, you know, like, if you ask me, OK, well, can you control that? Or can you anticipate that? Or you can just be open to that? But it's these surprises that I, I think, you know, I appreciate in architecture. I think you know? it's like and the professor talking about, and the book is Lolly Baker. Mm -hmm. It's a Lolly Baker. It's a, maybe you can explain about the Lolly Baker. You know better than me. I mean, sure, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, there's there was a there's there was a generation of architects, many of them were in, inspired by um, by Gandhian economics and philosophy, uh, you know, which which kind of oscillated between creating frameworks and create. Um, in the case of the engineers I was talking about today, uh, disseminating um, techniques and technologies, but but sometimes not designing anything. So I would say that. Lori Baker, of course, designed many uh, mm -hmm. incredible actual yeah. um, buildings in brick in Kerala, yeah. but 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 he also uh, was prolific uh, in terms of um, writing, producing, and draw hand drawing um, building manuals, mm -hmm. and I would say that that is also part of his kind of enduring legacy in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so I think that you know it's just it's it's interesting to think about the role of different kinds of, or the way knowledge making is codified in different forms, yeah. um, and how that kind of mediates, I guess, between, yeah. say, professional um, architects and and what we're calling, I mean, the, the rural, I don't think the traditional is really a great word for it because it's really um, rural and kind of fringe, uh, what we're calling today, modernities versus intersecting with other other kinds of modernities um, in the 20th century and in the present, yeah. um, it's not the it's not the kind of clash of the traditional and the modern as one would find in so much architectural discourse in the 20th century. It's something much more complex than that. I think that's that's in some ways what I was trying to get at in the in the lecture is that um, engineers went to went to uh, rural India looking for uh, a kind of uh, untouched um, uh, untouched patterns of architecture in rural life. That were continuous with the past, but ended up um, confronting the aspirations of those those very people in rural areas to to move to the city and to actually um, build a concrete home. And so, so I think people like Lori Baker actually um, very in many different ways negotiated those tensions in their work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to jump to the last question before we open it up, uh, I wanted to discuss issues of labor in building construction. So in the context of the rural, uh, so both traditional and inventive technologies, um, how do you differentiate between this, maybe the celebration of craftsmen or artisans and more exploitative labor practices of underpaid or uh, non-paid laborers? So maybe Kurt, you took this on a bit in your lecture with the kind of self-help um, but often the particular materials or building systems we work with are dictated by these labor economies. So I think across the three lectures, I'd like to hear just a bit more about labor before we open it up. Yeah, I guess I just want to follow up what you were talking about because I think it, it kind of relates to this question. Um, but like the artisan um, um, designs in a different way. You know, the engineer is almost more like an artisan because they have knowledge. They don't have to explain themselves in a certain way. And I think it's interesting. I mean, for me, I was always fascinated with Gandhi's, you know, his, his obsession with the Kadi shop, you know, which was the, the it was a kind of, um, you know, colonialization as a kind of legacy, you know, and industrialization as a kind of, which allowed that to happen. And it's still an extension of that. You know, for me, it's it's really like, how do you, you know, step outside of, you know, those, that entire network, yeah. you know, which, which you, you're never going to, um, you're never going to really empower people, you know, until you, you step outside of that. And maybe we're actually arguing with the, 
the first panel. You know, I mean, I have this discussion with Josh all the time, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but I'm interested in technology, you know, and, and, and in the question of like, can technology allow you to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, especially, that's why I'm interested in the 3D printing. Um, you know, so it's a question like, does it tie you more into it or does it actually empower you to step, mm -hmm. to, to, to break that? Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. But, yeah, I mean, you're inventing things too. Yeah, it, it's it, to me, it's like an, uh, when I talk, it's like an, the brick. It, it, the uh, the brick is uh, not only about and uh, only the, the life and the labor, like the labor cost. It, it, it related about the economy, you know, it, and the community economy. That when we 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 make it the brick, it, it like and you have to spend the money to the community. But it's and uh, I, I come from the the undeveloping country, you know. It and uh, you know that is it. And uh, the big it, it my break it related about the political because it and uh, as we know that it and under developing country we have too many corruption. But I want to make the big it because to the big it and the raw material it come from nature. It's very cheap. So if the labor cost, if we want to put if the labor cost it to and the people community. So it then you cannot make it the corruption. Because it then all of the tax, all of the money that from the government, we try to put in the big. And even we make the big, even after that we use the big is to make the construction. Most of all is almost 90% need to come from the labor cost. So it can, we can and uh, reduce the corruption. And you have to like the architect that can use it. It lies and the hidden agenda, but don't tell any don't tell anyone. It just it lies and uh, you put the idea that something okay. That we make a big, we make a big. Thing. It's like and uh, the under, another one is an elephant dam. So if we try to, because it's the world is under climate change, it, we have too many problems. It's a big issue. But it, to me, I think it's just it's very simple. Because it, the elephant it need the food. They need to eat it. But it, we have to a lot of them. So it, and, uh, if we next the dam, it become to the big bit. And being the big is to sell. And then if the money go to and the, the, the elephant to buy the food. Mm. So it's like in the cycle. The cycle, it makes the elephant happy to eat it. We have the food <laughs> all the year. And, and people, they're happy to have in the brick to use it. Right? That's really I, fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm just going to cut in here. Um, just be mindful of the schedule. We can um, open one question to the audience. We can take one question. <laughs> OK. You, Sophia, you pay. <laughs> oh, sorry, hands again. I didn't see. Sorry, you first. Who has the easiest question? <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to uh, ask a little bit about like the decision of saying or accepting that we, in order to work with in the methodology that you are working, we have to step out of the regulations or step out of the mainstream like way that architecture is produced. I kind of wonder if there is a strategy or uh, going back to what Lily was saying, how these moments are expanding or can challenge like the, and become something in the greater image of architectural uh, production can be. So I'm wondering if there's strategies of like regional uh, techniques and materials or this uncontrolled process of building can become part of a much more controlled process of main, mainstream regulations and exist within that? And what would be the strategy about introducing uh, such approach to building and design in a much more uh, formal way of producing architecture? 
I'm trying to think of another word to describe it, you know, like beyond um, strategy. You know. I'm trying to think of a metaphor for, for what is actually happening. Like, does Jamie Oliver have a strategy, you know, or, or he, he just has uh, experience, you know, like what makes you a good chef? For me, I mean, that's always something I'm always thinking about. You know, what makes you creative? I think there's like a lot of other forces. You know, I, I think it has to do with experience. I think it has to do with uh, intuition. I think it has to do with imagination. Um, I think that it has a lot to do with empathy. And it's almost like knowledge, but used in an extremely um, flexible and an extremely, you know, it's like the ability to open your fridge. You know, if you, you have a friend who's like really good at cooking, they open the fridge, they see what's there. And I think quite amazing things come out of it. Sometimes not, you know, like I try to emulate that and sometimes it's a disaster. So I don't know. I mean, um, the mainstream, I don't know what, I don't know if there's, there's probably different degrees of mainstream. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not as disciplined yeah. as you. You don't have a secret project, <laughs> like a secret, <laughs> secret child. But it, and I, I, I worked for a developer that, once. I, 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 designed a, I designed a shopping mall. <laughs> you know? It was horrible. I had to ask him to, to take my name away <laughs> and not detach myself. Yeah. And and I, so I have nothing to say about the, the mainstream, <laughs> the biggest developer in China. It was a, yeah. it was a dream project. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. thought this is going to be so great. Finally, I made it. I'm going to work with Vanka and I'm going to do a giant yeah. underground yeah. shopping mall. Yeah. And yeah. It was it terrible. Was like, and, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. he asked about and he, yeah. he learned, he studied about and uh, work a lot of the philosophy, like the criteria is and the uh, Many rules, right? So it's then the you. But sometimes it when we the some student not you, it then ask me about it like that. But I said that not about you, and it's about <laughs> and the the student is ask me. I said that. Oh, I think you have to forget what you have learned before. Right? If you forget it, you will feel like and you flee mm. to do that. And then you give and the reason to answer that everything that you have the question. Mm. So it's okay, like not I having preconceptions. You have to learn everything. Uh, no, you have to forget everything <laughs> that, right? have that you have learned. Yeah. Okay. Mm. After after university, you know, if you study in your university, you have to remember. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Don't first year students, don't forget what you learn in the first year, even <laughs> the second year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and but actually, this year. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know that we do have uh, the questions, so we'll take two which has already raised their hand. So one is Roman, our first year Bjarg, and then Peter. Yeah. And, and that will be it. So. So I think, um, thank you for this, I think, beautiful uh, Preston Thomas, I think very appropriately framed around the fringe. And so if one were to, the guttural question is who pays for all this? But if one were to contextualize it within this, this sort of um, provocation of the fringe, the fringe accommodates a particular kind of human, meaning the state allows for a particular kind of human to occupy this territory that then has to figure out how to accommodate that human. And then the architect enters in um, to figure out ways to accommodate the human. So whether it's the case of Mongolia or the cases that we saw in the second half, the architect is always trying to negotiate his value or her value within that context. And so the question then, who pays for this? I think it also wants to ask then, what kinds of permission does that allow? What kinds of failure do you accept within that context? And then how do you then see the role of the architect if one has to sort of be more transparent about who pays for all of this? Right. Well, I just think it's worth noting that in, in 
in what I was talking about and, and within a kind of larger context of what was called self-help housing, which wasn't always a term that was applied to the cases I was looking at, but it was frequently in the global south that people, people paid for it themselves. They pay, I mean, they paid with their free labor, right? So I think that's always important to remember. Um, when we also talk, in, in the last panel, there was a conversation about the, um, the potentials and contradictions and ultimate failures of the incremental. And I think that, I think that, that is, is one of them, <laughs> is the assumption, um, especially that both the rural, or the rural and urban poor, which are, which are of course intimately connected, uh, not just in South Asia, but all throughout the global south, right? People are migrating to the city, but also going back, sending remittances back. Um, but there's an assumption that they will contribute their own free labor that is built into many of these housing programs. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, just as a kind of direct response to the question of you know, who pays for that. It's also in this case often the, 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 the householder themselves. Mm -hmm. To me, I have to only one word, responsibility. What was that? Responsibility. Mm. I, I personally like the barter system, you know, but, but to get to your point, I mean, I think the economy is really important, you know, um, but it's interesting for me, the barter system is a system where value is gained on both sides, you know, and then you have this monetary system. We're talking about colonialization. I guess it's a lot big on people's mm -hmm. minds, but that was, a, that was also uh, essentially a financialization, you know, it was uh, East India Company was really like the first company and shareholders. And um, so when you say like who pays for it, I mean, somebody ultimately pays. There's, there's an economy to things, but I think the one skill the architect is able to, to do is to um, think about value in a different way and to, to transfer value, you know, so I think for me, there's no architecture until you get, you think about economy, but you have to think about economy and values in a much broader sense, you know, in a much more flexible sense. And this project that, that I did was just such a failure. The problem was that, you know, I was doing this amazing structure and they said, we don't have any money for it, we don't have money for it. So it just got simpler and simpler and simpler until it was just like, you know, column and frame. And then we had to do the materials. And I thought, well, it's so simple. They don't have any money, so we'll just do bricks, you know, stuff I like, concrete. And they said, no, 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 that looks too cheap. You're not spending enough money, so you, you have to, you know, try these materials. They, they use this in the Apple shop. You should use this. So it was a formula. And because, you know, until you can break that formula, it didn't actually cost more. It was, for me, also a realization. It's a, the, the, it's a mindset as well, you know, and I, I can't, I'd have no answer for how you break that mindset, but the good news is that, you know, it, it's not just about costing more or less, mm. it's, it's only because it's just a formula, and I think we're, we're inventing other formulas that are just as valid, I think, mm. and deal, deal with different value systems. Mm. But it, it's a good question, I mean, it's mm. an important one. Mm. The architect pays with their life, <laughs> their health. <laughs> uh, hello, so uh, my name is Roman from uh, First Year Architecture Undergraduate Program, and as I have promised, my question will be the easiest one. So first of all, I really appreciate for all the guests for this beautiful presentation. And especially, I was really impressed by the first presentation in terms of um, artificial intelligence in 3D printing buildings. And it came up with one question in my mind. So would you think one day uh, human architects would be replaced by artificial intelligent uh, architects? <laughs> that was an easy question. <laughs> I know it's like yes, no, no, no. I, I mean, I um, the, the, okay. I, I'll answer seriously. Um, the, the best um, lecture I saw about um, artificial intelligence was, um, I think, uh, Richard Feynman. Do you know Richard Feynman? They, they call him like the Great Explainer. So he's a physicist, 
Mm -hmm. And Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply enough, then you don't know well enough. And he talks about artificial intelligence. And there's just some things which are so easy for humans to do, which are like nearly impossible for robots. And, and I think what we're trying to do is um, tap into those things and dig into those things. So I would say the question is, I hope not, mm -hmm. you know, because again, I think that um, you have to be human to design. And also what I think is great is that it's natural part of humanity, you know? Like architecture students, you already, you've lived already, you've lived in spaces, you have communities and families, and you know, the question of how do we tap into that? You know, the knowledge is already there. You know, so I, I think, yeah. Thank you. On that important and beautiful note for John's oh, response, yeah. uh, we will conclude and finish the Preston Thomas Symposium today. Thank you so much, and thank you to our speakers.